All right, so let's get uh, going on this um, final class, probably for most of you, before spring break. So uh, before we get into uh, what we're going to be uh, talking about today in terms of your uh, advanced lab research project, um, I just want to mention uh, the next uh, phase of the social media professional development um, project, that, uh, the optional project we're working on. So for this one, uh, this time it's all gonna be about uh, the idea of developing your brand. And what that basically means in terms of your professional Twitter account is that you want your account to be focused on one sort of area. So people will follow you um, because of the content that you produce. And what they find is that if your content is too varied, if you just kind of have uh, a mishmash of things that your account is about, then people will stop following you because there seems to be a lot of things that they're not interested in. So you want to kind of develop a focus, you know, one or two areas that you predominantly um, interact with. And uh, that's what this phase is going to be about. So uh, again, your Twitter account should have a unified theme. It's okay to have one or two, uh, one or two but you don't want too many. So for example, uh, in my theme, uh, I do a lot of work on um, psychology of aesthetics, psychology of art, and I also post uh, things about uh, educational psychology. So what you are going to do this time around is uh, I'm asking you to tweet three articles about any area of psychology that you're passionate about. So links to any articles online uh, in whatever area that you are particularly interested in, probably for a lot of you, it will be what your um, advanced lab project is about. Uh, anyway, so you probably have a ton of these that you could choose from, but uh, just to give you an example uh, in the psychology of art, here's one from uh, the Smithsonian about a new study that uh, tells us why architects design so many buildings with curves in them. Uh, architects find curves much more aesthetically pleasing than the typical average individual does. So uh, that's an explanation of why they design the way that they do. And uh, here's another one from Harvard Magazine about uh, the effects of empiricism on art. So the ability to try to explain art by actually studying not what art is, but maybe what people think art is, which is something that you can actually measure empirically. And then here's one more on, again, just our reactions to uh, art. So uh, if you do like dogs playing poker, uh, science is trying to figure out why is something like this uh, so very popular. So, um, you know, this, um, this one was actually really interesting. There was another study released last month by psychologists at Boston College found that a big reason people favor an artist's work over an identical copy is their belief that some essence of the artist is left behind in the original. So if you ever wonder why an original piece of art is so, so expensive, Whereas a poster of that piece of art is not, part of it is not just the rarity, it's the actual feeling that there's something that the artist left behind in that piece of art. So again, uh, any three articles uh, that you want, uh, choose a common theme, and uh, we're going to uh, use the following hashtags to keep track of these. Um, first one, IUSB MySych Area 01, retweet number two, IUSB MySych Area 02, retweet number three, IUSB MySych Area Three. And uh, we'll have the due date uh, for this by Monday, March 18th. So anytime over the next week and a half, whatever uh, grabs your fancy or as you're working on your advanced uh, lab project, if you find something particularly interesting uh, online or one of your previous articles, uh, feel free to retweet those. Use the hashtag so I can track it. And uh, that is social media development part six. Oh. Started up with the wrong file here. I wonder. All right. So on to so that makes sense. All right. So on to today's class. Uh, writing your results, writing your theory discussions, uh, theories, and future research. So. Um, just to kind of let you know where we're getting to, and again, just kind of focus on that big picture idea. Um, the undergraduate, uh, South Bend Undergraduate Research Conference is coming up. And uh, right about now, 
when it starts to get a little bit closer, when it starts to get a little bit real. Right about now is when I find sometimes the students start to get a little anxious about actually taking their, um, taking their work that has been very private up until this moment and pushing it out uh, into the public. So I just want to let you know a few things uh, for that. So when we come back from spring break, we got one more week. So the week when we come back, that's going to be our week about talking to, about how to put the paper all together, right? So we're going to have all of our sections um, written up, uh, and we're going to talk about how to pop that all together. Um, this is actually, uh, I've updated, uh, no, actually, never mind that. I've updated the syllabus, make sure you're using a new syllabus. But anyways, uh, the week after that is going to be dedicated to starting on our uh strategies for actually presenting. So I spend a lot of time in the advanced lab class to actually tell you how to prepare a conference talk presentation, what's the best strategy for making an effective uh, presentation, uh, a big one here, strategies for dealing with questions. So you are under no obligation to ever answer the question that was asked of you, but that is something that is needs to be trained, so we do that um, as well. I'm going to talk about how to do your poster presentations. And then, uh, importantly, April 9th and April 11th, that is the week of the Undergraduate Research Conference. If you cannot, absolutely cannot, um, present on April 12th uh, for you know reasons beyond your control, uh, these two days are going to be open for people to present their work. They can't go to the Undergraduate Research Conference. And or, if you are presenting at the Undergraduate Research Conference, but you just want a practice run for that, uh, you can also present on one of these two days. We'll have room for five presentations per day, so there will be uh, hopefully enough room for anybody that might uh, need that. So, a lot of prep to get you ready, to get you ready to stand in front of an audience and basically communicate your, uh, your wonderful work. So just to give you even more confidence moving forward, just so that you can see that URC and say, yes, I'm going to kill it at the URC. I'm going to take a little moment now to toot my own horn and just mention some of the uh, uh, my students' records at the uh, URC. So how have my students done at the URC? So last year, uh, we had Faith Stahl, and uh, she presented tactile metaphor perception uh, on the Lamo theory. And they offer awards at the URC. And uh, the year before that, I was snubbed, I was robbed, but that's another story. Uh, 2016, uh, Christopher Crawford, Structural and Contextual Frameworks, Interpretation of Metaphorical Exaggerated Size. Uh, also 2016, uh, Charles Jackson, Metaphorical Devices and Pictures, Lomo Theory, uh, Predicts Depictions of Superhuman Speed. So I've presented a lot of work uh, with students at the URC. My students have presented their work. I always kind of think of it as our project. But how do we do? Well, Faith, uh, she won uh, honorable mention for outstanding presentation. Uh, Christopher won honorable mention for outstanding presentation. Charles won honorable mention for outstanding presentation. So that is the last three years. You go back even further, uh, Jeff Trowbridge, Effects of Mood State Upon Musical Preferences. Uh, Beth Dobson, Body Image, Visual and Touch Perception. And then Jackie McDowell, Loss of uh, Locus of Control Across Settings. Um, Jeff won the Outstanding Presentation, uh, Beth won Outstanding Presentation, and Jackie won Outstanding Presentation as well. So, bottom line, I will get you ready. I have a six out of seven year winning streak at the URC, all right? If you watch The Voice, I am the Blake Shelton of the <laughs> URC, all right? So I will get you ready for the URC. So as you're kind of working on it and thinking about that URC abstract and all that kind of stuff, just know that if you have any anxiety whatsoever, we will talk about strategies, the anxiety will go away, and I expect everybody here to do amazing and uh, help us bring home that award uh, one more year. All right, so once again, kind of focusing on where we're trying to end up with that published article, that conference talk presentation. Uh, today we're going to wrap up our look at uh, the results section and uh, the discussion section. So uh, we're going to have a URC abstract reminder, um, results section resources reminder, 
Then we're going to take a look at uh, or give you suggestions on how to handle your data uh, if you're using Qualtrics and also if you're uh, entering it into Excel. So there's a lot of tools that you can use to kind of um, speed that process up. So as we start collecting that data, I just want to make sure that you're aware of some of those uh, strategies. Final notes on the results section, and then we'll talk about the discussion section, uh, how to deal with theories and future research. All right, so just a reminder, uh, URC um, abstracts, they are due Friday, March uh, 22nd. Your homework assignment abstract is due uh, by midnight on the 18th. So be sure to um, uh, send those in. 250 words uh, is uh, what you have to summarize your entire paper. And just to let you know, uh, I've already received uh, one abstract, read it over, made some suggestions, uh, sent it back to the student. So I will be looking if you want to get these in early, um, get a head start on them. I'll be regularly checking Canvas, but um, definitely, you know, make sure, be sure that you're working on that. Mm -hmm. So do we have to have our results completed at that point then to send an abstract? No, not at all. Okay. So every conference that I've ever gone to understands that you might not be completely done your study. And that's a continuum that different researchers are on. I knew, I've worked with researchers that would only send in things that were 100% done. Like we have run the last subject, we've done all the stats, this is what we're sending in. I have known other researchers who have run a few subjects and they said, the conference is three months off, let's send this in. So you guys are in the position where you don't need to have your project completed. But um, the key is, is that at the time when you submit your abstract, Submit the synopsis of the story that you have, and then that's um, that's what you submit. If it changes by the day of the conference, no big deal. All right. So results section resources reminder: Don't forget that we have the in the statistics resources. You got your one-stop statistics shop. You got your results section templates, reporting statistics in APA style. So we went over this last class. Be sure to use these. So when we were doing the IRB. Protocols, for example, there was a lot uh, of information on stock answers, uh, stock procedures, and I was a little bit surprised that uh, not every student used those. So we have procedures put in place for how are you going to maintain privacy. We have procedures put in place for how are you going to recruit subjects, and um, you know you were encouraged to use those answers to, as guidelines, and many of you did and your IRBs went through very quickly. Some of you didn't, and it took a little bit longer because you were basically trying to reinvent the wheel when we were basically saying, here's a wheel. So just as a reminder, I have found some resources. They are in Canvas. You can also find a lot on Google. Feel free to use these. So feel free to take this APA formatted uh, report for an ANOVA and copy and paste it into your results section and change what you need to change in order for it to reflect your results. So there was a significant main effect for your variable, F, your statistics, and a significant interaction, F, your statistics. Don't feel that you need to change anything else. You don't need to paraphrase the results section the way that you do other sections of your uh, paper. So use these resources, find your test, use the APA formatted, uh, templates that, they are, that are provided, and uh, just be aware that uh, it will take you literally like 80% written for your uh, results section. You just need to change up what needs to be changed up and make sure you do change that up as well. So the other thing to remember is uh, also is that if you don't find your results section uh, um, tests in those uh, resources, Google is filled with these resources. So if you just put in your statistical test APA format, you will have a long list of resources that will tell you how to report your study in APA format. Please take advantage of those because it will, number one, make things a lot easier for you. Number two, it'll give you a better final product as well. All right, so now we're going to uh, take a look at uh, something new, how to handle data from Qualtrics to Excel to SPSS. 
So this is going to be uh, what a lot of you are going to do. And uh, what I just want to do is just kind of give you an, a little bit of insight into how you can handle this. So let me just zoom in. Okay, so when you export from Qualtrics, uh, you will typically get something that looks like this. You'll typically get uh, a, a list of subjects. You'll also get, you know, I, um, the uh, I, not ISBN. Um, you'll get a lot of other stuff, a lot of other data. Their um, IP addresses, right? You'll get some of that data. You'll get some other uh, outputs that you don't need to do anything with. But importantly, you'll have your subjects, and then you'll have the questions that you ask and uh, the responses that they have. So in this example here, survey number one gave us 10 questions. And let's say survey number one is your independent variable. How did they score on survey number one? Survey number two, we had four questions. And these were all on Likert scales. Survey number one had a seven point Likert scale. Survey number two had a four point Likert scale. This is very typically the output that you might get. And what you wanna do is you need to go from that Qualtrics output to an Excel output that you can use that is um, that is useful for your particular uh, analysis. So what I highly recommend is set up your Excel so that it will be able to um, work with one uh, subject and then you can copy and paste that and it'll work with any other subject that you uh, might need to do. So for example, we have subject number one here and we have their scores on this particular survey, right? So we got subject number one, we got their scores on a particular survey and we need to sum their scores on this first survey here. But notice that question one is scored forward, but question two is reverse score. Right, so question number one might be, you know, how much uh, do you like tomatoes? And question number two is, how much do you hate tomatoes, right? So if we're measuring it, this is reverse score. So what you can do is you can simply say, all right, for question number one, I am gonna make this cell here, my cell output, I'm gonna make that equal to their answer on question number one. And once you have that set up, you can do that for every question that is not reverse scored. So question number three, I'm going to copy that formula right there. And question number three, which is forward scored, I'm going to copy that. Uh, question number, whoops, what happened here? Second question number three is reverse scored. Never mind that, you'll get the point. Question number four here, five, six, seven, nine, and ten. All right, so we have all of those questions that are forward scored, there they are for that particular subject. What about the reverse scored? Well, what we wanna do is we want something to change that seven to a one. We need something to change that one to a seven. We need something to change that four to a four, right? So seven becomes one, six becomes two, three becomes five, four becomes four, five becomes three, uh, six becomes two, and seven becomes one. One easy way to do that, is to just choose one number greater than your Likert options. So in this case, equals eight minus their particular response. So we have a two there, eight minus two, that gives us six. If it was a seven, eight minus seven, that gives you a one. If it was a four, eight minus four, that gives you a four. So that reverse scores your, uh, your particular survey question. And you can copy that and paste it into all the other reversed scored <laughs> questions. And then finally for survey number two, we have just a forward scoring. None of the questions are reverse scored. So we have a forward scoring of, uh, of, question, of survey number two. Once you have that set up, you can set up a column here with survey number one. Sorry about that. You can set up a column here with survey number one. You can set up a column here with survey number two. And now you're ready to use formulas in Excel 
to sum all of the responses for survey number one and all of the responses for survey number two. So we can go equals, sum is the formula that you're looking for in this case, highlight the cells that have the answers to survey number one, hit enter, and we find out that, um, that subject number one scored 47 on survey number one. We can do that for survey number two, equals sum, highlight your four questions in survey number two, and we see that uh, this subject scored eight on survey number two. Take your time to set this up so that you can do this, because the great thing about doing this in Excel is that you will only have to do this for the first subject. And after you do the first subject, you can run 15 subjects, 20 subjects, 30 subjects, super quick, super fast, because when you set it up with these functions, and I'm actually gonna put the subject number as a function as well, what you can do is you can take that entire column, copy it, move one item down, paste it, and you'll notice that now I got all the answers for subject number two. And I have the sum of subject number two's answers on um, survey one, subject number two's answers on survey two. And it's continued to reverse score. I can't even see which ones it was. There, it's continued to reverse score question number two. Right, subject two said it was a six, that counts as a two. And the great thing about this is that it doesn't matter if you have five subjects, it doesn't matter if you have 10 subjects, it doesn't matter if you have 100 subjects, it does not matter if you have 1,000 subjects. I just scored all of these 15 subjects in about two seconds because you set it up, you set up that formula. So use that when you're analyzing your data. When you get your Qualtrics output, take a look at which scores need to be added together. Does anything need to be reverse scored? And take some time setting up the formulas for subject number one, because then that allows you to just go down with your, um, to copy and paste it all the way down, and you can run 50 subjects and analyze them as quickly as you can analyze you know, two subjects. All right, so that's to get it to Excel. I used summation functions, I used equals function, and I used, um, uh, I used uh, the minus sign. There are tons of functions in, uh, in Excel. So once again, Google what you need to do. You can literally just say, how can I find the biggest score in Excel? And it will tell you about the max function. How can I order my scores in Excel? And it'll tell you about sort. There's a ton of resources online. Make sure that you're using these uh, 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 statistical packages to do the work that they were made for. All right, so just one last little thing I wanna show here as well. Let's say that we now have survey number one, survey number two. These are the answers of our uh, for our subjects. And let's say, that we gave them survey number one to, to classify them as either high, stay with the tomato example, high tomato likers or low tomato likers, right? We wanted to split our 15 subjects into subjects that liked tomatoes a lot versus subjects that did not like tomatoes. One thing that you can do now is you can take your formulas and be very careful with this. Whenever you use the sort function, most of the times you don't want to sort the formulas. You want to sort the actual values. So what you can do once you have your actual values calculated, if you copy them and then go to paste, don't press the paste icon, press the little arrow and it'll give you all of these options. The one you're looking for is paste values. So this is a whole bunch of formulas I'm done pasting my formulas. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paste the values, paste the actual scores. And now what I can do is if I highlight these, I can go here to data. So right up there to data, I can go to sort and I can sort my values by survey number one and I can do it from largest to smallest. And now I have my data sorted from the highest scores on survey one 
down to the low scores on survey one. And again, if I was using this to split my subjects up into a high group and a low group, I can then say, all right, the first top seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are going to be the high group. The lowest eight are going to be the low group. And now this is ready for SPSS. And you can just copy and paste this straight into SPSS. So again, the key here is that you don't want to spend time running, or sorry, you don't want to spend time analyzing and uh, calculating the data for every single subject, because that is going to balloon your time uh, rather largely. What you want to do is spend your time working on that first subject, set these formulas up so that it can calculate scores for each of your surveys, for each area of your uh, experiment. And then as you get your data from SPSS, you can very easily just copy and paste those functions. And uh, like I said before, you can run and analyze the data for one subject. You can analyze the data for 100 subjects about as fast as you can analyze the data for one using these formulas. So take advantage of that um, so that you can focus and use your uh, time for other things like writing up your results section and writing up your discussion. Any questions on using Excel for this? All right. And there. Okay, so that was handling data from Qualtrics to Excel to SPSS. So now let's take a look at some final notes for your results uh, section. So as you're thinking about writing up your results section, probably asking yourself, how long does my results section uh, have to be? And uh, the uninteresting answer is, it's got to be as long as it needs to be. So this is going to completely depend on the statistical test that you ran. So if you're running a single correlation, your results section might be one paragraph long. Well, no, that's your reporting of your, st uh, your, reporting of your statistical test might be just one little paragraph long. If you're running an ANOVA, you will need one paragraph for the first main effect, one paragraph for the second main effect, one paragraph for the interaction is going to get you a little bit longer. If you have two dependent measures, that's going to double your results section size. So how long does it need to be? It needs to be as long as it needs to be, but what you need to include, all right? So let this guide your length. You need to define your dependent variable. So you need that section right at the beginning that tells your reader what the conceptual definition is of the thing that you measured, right? So the conceptual definition of, um, you know, subject's preference, the conceptual definition of speed of learning, the conceptual definition of whatever it was that you were uh, measuring as your dependent variable. And then very importantly, your operational definition as well. So how did you measure it? How did you get to the numbers that you are going to um, that you are going to report. So, if you measured subjects' depressions, uh, levels of depression, this is where you say, you know, uh, levels of depression was measured by a subject score on the Bex depression inventory. You literally have to tell them this is the procedure that I used to get those numbers. Um, you know, subjects. Uh, uh, subjects' uh, proficiency, cognitive proficiency, was measured by both their reaction times and how long it took them to complete the task, as well as their accuracy, their percent correct for the task. So you don't have to get into the minute details of we added this question to this question, but subtracted this question and then added this question. You don't need to do that, but you do need to tell them, you know, we use this survey. We, um, you know, took the number of correct, divided it by the number of, you know, total responses, whatever it is, given that operational definition. And importantly, I didn't, I don't have it up here, but importantly, give them one line about what a higher score means and what a lower score means. So if I say something like, oh, we use the Beck's depression inventory to measure depression, it is so reader friendly to just have that one little line that says, 
Higher scores on the Beck's depression inventory indicate higher levels of depression. Lower scores on the inventory indicate lower levels of depression. Because otherwise, you're just at demanding your reader to do some of those mental gymnastics. Be friendly to your reader. Nobody wants to read your results section, right? It's the hardest section in the entire paper. Be nice to your reader. Guide them through it. All right, so once again, how long does it need to be? Everybody's going to have this. It's probably going to be the same size for uh, everyone. Then you state your statistical test. Then you say... You know, we use an alpha of 0.05 for all statistical tests. Uh, we ran a, um, a simple linear regression, you know, using the following variables. This with these levels, this with this level. We ran a uh, repeated measures ANOVA using a this uh, variable with uh, levels multiplied by this variable with levels designed. Uh, we did a correlation analysis. We did a chi-squared analysis. Whatever it is that your test is, State your statistical test, and then after you're done stating this is the test that we use, state your results in a very general, jargon-free way. So state something that says, in general, scores in this condition were higher than scores in this condition. No statistics, just a sort of almost like a conversational thing. So in general, as reaction times increased, uh, accuracy uh uh, also increased. Uh, in general, we found, um, you know, that uh, low levels of complexity and high levels of complexity led to low preference, but middle levels of complexity led to high preference. Just a very kind of jargon-free uh, description of your uh, results. So once you've done that, you've told them what you've measured and how you've measured it and what higher and lower scores mean. You told them how you tested it and you told them in general what you found, then you're ready to report your effects, your statistics, and your results. So you're then ready, and your reader's ready, to say, yes, we found this effect. Here are the numbers to back it up, and this is what the result is. Scores for males were higher than scores for females. Yes, we found this effect. Here's the results to back it up, and here's what the effective uh, effect is. Uh, the picture condition had lower rates of recall than the, uh, than the word condition. That's what you want to report. And this right here is where you definitely want to go to those stats resources and see how they did this, all right, and use those uh, resources to your advantage. And this is going to be the part that is going to vary between projects the most, right? So some of you are going to have a very short report your effects, statistics, and results. Some of you are gonna have a much longer report your effects, statistics, and results. You, you're done after you report all of your effects, statistics, and results. So uh, be sure to report everything. So report the things that were significant, report the things that weren't significant. So if you have an ANOVA with three independent variables, I don't think anybody does, but if you have an ANOVA, with three independent variables, you got three main effects, you got three two-way interactions, and you have one three-way interaction. You do this seven times, right? One, crap it up on my head. You do this seven times, one for each of those effects. Even if you didn't find anything for some of those effects. All right, and also use tables and figures, help your reader, with that. So uh, there's a reason children's books are filled with pictures. It's because they help you understand what's going on. In a confusing narrative, like in a results section, use your pictures. Your, your readers will love it. So if you're saying that males scored higher than females, send them to figure one where they can see that bar. Oh yeah, the male bar is higher than the female bar. I get what they're saying. Thanks for the picture. All right, any questions on that? All right, final, final notes. Important. So your results section is going to be submitted to Canvas with your discussion section as a single document. So before we had these two assignments split up, just want to be sure that everybody's very clear, we are going to hand this in as one document for review. 
So as soon as you're done your results section, you hit that enter key, center discussion, and then start with your discussion section. So one single document uploaded to Canvas, and uh, the due date on this is going to be March 20th. So it's going to be on the Wednesday after we uh, come back. And uh, I saw some faces being made. If you're still collecting data, write up what you got so far. It's going to not change very much. You know, as uh, after the 20th, it's not going to really, you're not going to have an influx of 100 subjects that are going to change the entire narrative. Um, so write up what you got. If you got to need to make minor changes afterwards, that's what the reviews and the uh, drafts are for. All right, any final, final questions on the results section? Okay, so let's finish up with the uh, discussion section. So theories and future research. So if you remember last time, we were talking about the general outline for your discussion section. So general outline is this. Number one, you present the conclusions uh, from your research. Um, then next little section, uh, does your research fit with uh, the previous theories? So these are going to be the theories that you brought up in your introduction. Next sec, oh, and why or why not? Next section, implications uh, of the results uh, of the research. What does this mean either theoretically for psychology as a science or applied? So what does this mean for the real world outside of the lab? How should this uh, research be applied to make our lives better? And then finally, you end with future research directions and you need suggestions for what you want to do as the next step and you need predictions and what they would imply. So we're going to talk today about uh, the second and fourth portions here. Does your research fit with previous theories? Why or why not? And uh, future research directions, how you handle those. All right. So does your research fit with previous theories? Why or why not? This is directly tied into your uh, hypothesis and whether or not it was supported. So just real quickly backing up, present the conclusions of your research. This is where you say hypothesis one was supported by the results. We predicted that we should see an increase in reaction times, and we did see an increase in reaction times. Hypothesis number two was not supported by our results. We Hypothesis number two predicted that reaction times would be stable. Uh, we found increases in reaction times. Those are the conclusions from your results. You are then, after you mention the hypotheses and which ones were supported or not supported, you're ready to say whether your results fit or support the previous theories that you brought up in your introduction. And spell it out for the reader, why do they or why don't they? So if your hypothesis is supported, so if you have a hypothesis that is supported, what that means is that your results fit and or support, same idea, they fit with the theory that formed that hypothesis. So every hypothesis has the form of if this theory is true and we do this to subjects, we should find this result. If you find that result, that means that you support the, the uh, proposition that this theory is true. So if your results, uh, if your hypothesis is supported, that means your results fit with the theory that formed the hypothesis. If your hypothesis is not supported, well, then it's the opposite. Then your results do not fit with the theory that formed the hypothesis. So make sure that going into writing your discussion section, take a look at your introduction and make sure that your hypotheses are tied directly to a theory. This is why we don't do hypotheses where we say things like, well, I think it'll be like this in this situation, or I have, I have a feeling. This is what I'm going to find. Feelings and, and thinkings are not supported. Um, uh, theories are. So tie your theory to your tie a hypothesis to a theory. And if that hypothesis is not supported, then your results do not fit with the theory. Your results do not do not support the theory that formed your hypothesis. All right. If your hypothesis is supported, so we have the hypothesis that is being supported situation here then you need to explain specifically and explicitly 
what parts of the theory are supported. So if when you find an effect that you predicted, go back and tell the reader, you know, this uh, hypothesis was supported. We predicted that we were going to see males score higher than females. We, in fact, did see males score higher than females. This supports the theory of mental rotation, uh, specifically the aspect that says mental rotation has to do with uh, the size of the, I'm going to start making stuff up because I'm not a neuropsychologist, the size of the amygdala. And uh, because the amygdala is larger in males, uh, they should be better at mental rotation. That's the part of the theory that this uh, result supports. So don't just say that, oh yeah, our results support this particular theory. Spell it out for the reader. A good writer, it will be obvious at that point. But again, we don't want our reader to have to do that extra work. Our reader is already trying to hold on to the information that we've been giving them. Be very nice to the reader. It's almost as if, again, think of that uh, murder mystery novel, right? The, the, one of the big rules for murder mystery novels, they were laid down by people like Agatha Christie and G.K. Uh, Chesterton and all the great murder mystery novel writers. They actually got together and said, these are the rules for writing a murder mystery novel. And one of the rules is you need to give the reader enough information so they can solve the mystery. That is a requirement of a murder mystery novel. What that means is that by the end of the novel, the reader has enough information to solve this murder. And yet no murder mystery novel has ever said, the detective has never said, well, we have all the suspects here and uh, you guys have seen all the clues. So my work is done. And they just walk out. No, they tell you it's this person and this is why. So even if you might've missed something, you're all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get it. I got it now. You got to do the same thing. By the time you get to this point, a reader that has followed your story should be able to say, oh, exactly, this part of the theory was supported, or this idea in the theory was supported, or this proposed mechanism of the theory was supported. But you tell them, oh, and by the way, this mechanism of the theory is exactly the part that was supported by a result. So explain it explicitly and specifically what part of your theory. It might support the whole theory. Mention that. This, is, this supports the theory because we found this and the theory specifically proposes this is how this mechanism works. So that's what we support. Uh, if your hypothesis is not supported, uh, you got to do the opposite thing. Explain explicitly and specifically what parts of the theory are not supported. All right. So once again, that murder mystery novel, this is the part where they go through the suspects that didn't murder you know, the, uh, um, the victim and explain why they couldn't possibly have done it. Right. So, Oh, you know, the, the murderer was left-handed and, uh, Mr. Smith is clearly right-handed. So he couldn't possibly be the murderer. You do that as well. If your hypothesis is not supported, a theory is not supported. Explain what parts of the theory were not supported. So explain that this mechanism that this theory postulates could not be or is not correct, is, is missing something, is somehow uh, not uh, an accurate depiction of what's going on, because if that was the case, we should have found these results. We didn't. It argues against that particular theory. All right. And finally, to kind of um, drive this home about as hard as I can, one of the hardest things to do, especially as somebody who's doing maybe their first piece of research, is to take a look at these big names, uh, take a look at these uh, big theories that uh, people have worked on for years and years and years, and then take a look at your results and say, my results don't fit with the theory, my results don't support the theory, what should I do? And the last thing you want to do is not be bold and uh, not uh, kind of uh, back your theory, I'm sorry, back your results. So what I kind of find some students often do is they take a look at their results, they take a look at the theory, they take a look at the fact that you don't have any letters after your name, you don't have degrees, they take a look at all these other people with degrees, and they think to themselves, you know what, I must have messed up somewhere, you know, I must have uh, done something wrong, right? 
because these get these people couldn't possibly be wrong. Must be something with mine. So then you start hedging your bets, you start hemming and hawing, and you start kind of pulling back from your results. It's almost like you walk into a you know a um, an aggressive situation with your results right next to you. And as soon as things start getting heated, your results are like, hey, you got my back, and you're like out the door going, oh, no, nope, sorry. Uh, don't abandon your results, right? We're doing good work here. So when you get there, if your results say that a theory is wrong, back them up and be bold and say that that theory is wrong. Don't start saying things like, well, there was weaknesses with our study. Don't start saying things like, well, it was an online study, so maybe subjects weren't paying attention. Don't start saying things like, well, you know, I only had 42 subjects, so maybe if I had more. No, back up your results. You know, be, a, be an ally for your results. Be bold. So keep that in mind. So, uh, again, it's, it's a historical fact that a lot of cutting-edge research, a lot of transformative research was done by people at all levels. In fact, some of the most productive and innovative research ever is done by people that are younger in the, uh, in the discipline. So uh, your 30s tends to be a kind of real sweet spot for a lot of really innovative work that's been done because as you kind of get older and you keep doing the same thing, you kind of get comfortable. You keep doing the same thing the same way and that doesn't usually lead, uh, lead to uh, big, big results. So if you got big results, back them up, be big. Just to kind of give you an example historically of when this happened. So Isaac Newton, he, uh, one of the fathers of uh, physics, he came up with what is known as the first uh, unification in physics. So he was the first one to say, all right, I'm going to unify all these ideas and all these different uh, forces in this one mathematical equation. He came up with his equation for gravity, first big, huge unification in physics. James Clerk Maxwell, he came up with the idea that, uh, he actually came up with the idea of electromagnetism. Uh, so the electro, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, that was James Clerk Maxwell. He came up, uh, he is credited as having the second grand unification in physics. So you got Newton, first grand unification of physics, huge figure in physics. You got James Clerk Maxwell, second unification in physics, huge figure in physics. And then all of a sudden, somebody took a look at Isaac Newton's theories and took a look at James Clerk Maxwell's theories and said, those two are incompatible. This person's work and this person's work both cannot possibly be true. And the person who pointed that out was a lowly patent clerk. He was working as the person who reviewed applications for patents and decided if a product deserved to go ahead in the process or didn't deserve to go ahead in the process. He was not at a major physics university. He was not working at some major physics research institute. And yet he noticed my research says these two giants, their ideas are incompatible, which means one of them or both of them is wrong. So that man, we're gonna end it like this, that was Einstein working as a patent clerk. And where would the world be today if he took a look at his position and said, you know what, I'm just a patent clerk. I'm just, these guys, I must have done something wrong. I don't want to publish this. I don't want to back it. Let me just, you know, kind of pull back from it. No, he wrote his paper and said, these two giants, one or both of them is wrong. And here are the reasons why. And we have the theory of relativity and all that other wonderful stuff. So that is my final sort of rah, 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 going into the, uh, the spring break, you know, be that person, be that person that says, you know what, this giant in the field, uh, they're wrong. Their theory is incorrect. Here are the results to back up my, my assertion. Uh, be that person that says, oh, this theory that was developed by these four or five leading scientists in psychology, it can't be correct because look at my results, uh, write it that way. Because again, you want to be the detective that says, Mr. Smith is the murderer, and here are the reasons why, and I'm sure about it, send him to jail. You don't want to be the person that says, well, I'm thinking maybe, 
I know you're a good guy, Mr. Smith, but I don't know. Maybe you did it. I got some stuff over here. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, I'm not really, I just, I got to go. Don't want to be that detective. Be the bold detective. So as you're writing your discussion, again, when you get to this, if your results say that the, the, that the theories are wrong, write that. And I don't want to see anything about not enough subjects. I don't want to see anything about this was done online. I don't want to see anything about intro psych population. I don't want to see anything about all the excuses. Don't back away from it. Move forward with it and be bold. All right. And then the last one here, future research directions. For your future research directions, this is almost like... Uh, you can think of this as like the post-credit scenes to a superhero movie. Kind of tells you what they can expect next. Kind of gets people excited, right? And it also helps to uh, alleviate any concerns they might have about, well, what about this alternative explanation? What about this thing? You basically are telling them, oh, and by the way, I know there's still work to be done. Here it is. This is what I'm going to do uh, next time. You don't actually have to do it. This is not a commitment that you're making to actually run this research. But you do want to have future research directions. So you need to make a suggestion, and then this is incredibly important, make a prediction. Because I find that a lot of students, when they're writing their first research paper in 211, and I ask for future research directions, they will say things like, oh, uh, a future research direction would be to redo this experiment with children with autism. And then that's it. And you're sitting there going, why? Why would you want to do that? So I know it's probably a good idea, but you need to have reasons because there are millions of possible future uh, areas for research. So if you're doing a memory experiment, that's what I use in P211. If you're doing a memory experiment, yeah, sure, do it with children with autism or do it with the elderly or do it with dogs or do it with um, uh, people who are left-handed versus right-handed or do it in a room that's hot versus cold or do it in a room that has beige walls versus primary colors, or do it where you have to listen to the words or read the words uh, visually, or do it where you're doing pictures uh, versus words, or do it, do it where you have distracting noise versus non-distracting noise, or you can just keep going. Each of those could be cool, could be interesting, but not if that's all that you say. So if all that you're saying is like, oh, we should do it with autism, with children who have autism, because I think it would be interesting to see how children with autism would do in this experiment. It's no good. It's not enough. But if you say, I would like to do this with children with autism because our research results, false memories were due to social interaction. So if children with autism do not have as high social interactions, they should show lower false memory rates. On the other hand, if false memory is not due to social interactions, children with autism should show the same levels of false memory rates. All of a sudden, it goes from one of many to an interesting, oh my gosh, I can't wait to, write, uh, wait to read that research, can't wait to see which one of those predictions it is, um, final research direction. So make that suggestion. You don't need more than one, one's just fine. If you got more than one, feel free, but make those predictions. What would a result in one direction indicate? What would a result in another direction indicate? And then uh, you are going to have weaknesses to your study. And you are going to have alternative explanations that are still open in your study. So no study has ever been perfect. And no study has ever ended psychology. Right? Nobody has ever done statistics on a study and then said, oh, we're done psychology, I guess that's it. Like psychology is finished. I can tell everybody else, go home, because I finished psychology. So what that means, you're gonna have alternative explanations. Maybe your results could be explained in a different way. And you're gonna have some study weaknesses. Maybe your, um, maybe your demographic, right? Given the way that uh, intro psych uh, courses typically are, uh, it's like two and a half, maybe three to one, female to male ratio, maybe you didn't get a lot of males. Alternative explanation, maybe the results would have been different, you know, for males versus females. That's a weakness to your study, but that goes right into 
your altern uh, sorry, your future research plans. So if you notice that your subjects, you know, were uh, if you if you think, for example, that your subjects doing it online was causing them to answer questions in a distracted way, then your future research is to redo this experiment in person, face to face, to control for the level of distraction. If you think that you didn't have enough male representation in your study, your future research is to redo this experiment with male subjects. And if the effects were due to gender, then with you know, male subjects, we should see higher results. However, if it's not due to gender, then with male subjects, we should see the same results. Whatever it is, these two you should mention, but turn them into future research uh, so that you're not undermining your own, uh, your own studies. So it's, it's like, um, <laughs> it's like when we talk about um, uh, strategies for questions, um, whenever I'm at a conference and somebody makes a good point and I realize that there is something in my study that's either missing, maybe I didn't look at a particular concept the right way, um, or, you know, maybe they pointed out a possible confound. Uh, what I always, always, always do is I acknowledge it and I turn it into future research. So if they say something like, well, you defined metaphor in this way. But according to this person, half of what you did was, uh, was known as what's called signs, and the other ones are what are called metaphors. So that would actually, you know, invalidate your results. You know, what do you think about that? And I'm like, well, that's very interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, a potential for my next project would be to take a look at that. And if you are correct, and that is actually the case, then we should find these results uh, in this way. But if you're incorrect, and these are actually metaphors, then we should see the exact same results as what I found, blah, blah, blah. Weakness pointed out, turn it into future research. Same thing with your paper. All right, so I think that is, yeah, that was it for today. So any final questions about anything before I unleash you on your spring break uh, time to work on your advanced project period? Anything at all? We good? All right, so uh, enjoy your break, work hard, get those results going, get that discussion going, use Excel to help you. It will save you a ton of time and uh, good luck on all this. And I can't wait to see what we have when we come back. And don't forget about your URC abstracts. I will be checking throughout uh, the, reading, uh, the reading week, the spring break. So send it to me whenever you get it done and I will send it back ASAP. Other than that, we're done for today.